panel is missing a member, but that's okay because we needed that 20 minutes. Go <laughs> um, tell Tom that uh, we, we really deeply care about him and we'll miss him in this panel. Our next panel is around making and manufacturing. What happens when you start to professionalize the operation? Do you lose some authenticity or do you not? Is there actually ways to navigate in there? So I'm really pleased to let Michael introduce himself and tell us a little more. Uh, okay, I am Mike and I have always been a maker. I, ever since I can remember I've been making stuff out of paper mache or making little wooden carts. And now, I've done that all my life, and now I'm making stuff like artificially intelligent powered radios and augmented reality maps. And it's all driven by the same thing, it's all driven by this creativity uh, and this curiosity and this idea that we want to create these things that kind of externalise our, our ideas and let the world see them. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief history of me and how I kind of got from one place to the other. Um, so I studied product design at the University of Dundee um, and there I kind of specialised in creating digital products, the digital physical products um, that actually worked. At the time a lot of the product design courses where you were making these sorts of things, people were just coming up with ideas and doing really nice renders of them but they didn't actually work. And we were really pushed hard to make these things work. So you started to really start to engage with the maker community, that was 13 years ago, maybe more than that, um, which looks very different then than it is now. Um, but that really gave me a taste for that sort of thing, and I was very much into it. And you kind of learned that you could make anything without knowing too much about stuff, because there was this community around you that could help you out with anything you wanted. Um, and from there, I went on to do a research position at the University of Dundee where I started to carry on making stuff um, with a very kind of craft sort of mentality where you're playing a lot with technologies. So you're taking technologies and you're taking them out of their kind of intended roles and looking at different ways how you can use them. Um, so the first research position I did was for a project called Bespoke where we were making internet connected objects for the private communities in Preston. Uh, and from there, I went on to do a PhD, which I don't know if that was the right decision or not. Uh, that lasted five years, and I was investigating um, conductive ink and what can we do with conductive ink. But I was looking at it from a very different angle than what some people were at the time. So, this was before um, the likes of bare conductive were on the market at the time, you know, so that it's like conductive ink for the kind of crafts market. Um, and the only people who are doing stuff were very high tech uh, engineers. But I was taking it, looking at it from a very similar angle as Bear Conductive were, and I ended up working with them quite a lot towards the end, where I'm taking this thing that's only ever been used by scientists, and I'm coming at it from a very sort of, I was at an art school and I was getting it in the art school and screen printing with it and just seeing what I could do with it at a very sort of craft level. Um, and it was very interesting, and through that I developed the notion of the craft technologist, and that's what my PhD was all about. Don't want to talk about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then after that I went on to carry on my academic life. I've been a researcher at the University of Dundee still, um, where we're looking at ways of connecting the dying high street, whether it's dying or not is another question, uh, to the internet to find ways of rejuvenating it. Um, and during this project, I started to do a bit more batch production of the things I was making. So I made a series of little objects, digital objects, that batch, batch produced and started to kind of learn about that. At this point, I've not sold anything. I've not made money from my making, but I've been paid, which is great. Um, so I'm going to kind of come to this idea of professionalising making from quite a different angle. Um, where I'm not necessarily making products and selling them. I might kind of start to get that towards the end of where I am now. Um, so after that, I was a bit disillusioned by academia and I wanted to move into something more commercial. So I moved down to Liverpool, so this was about three years ago, and joined Uniform, which is a design company just about 20 minutes from here. Um, quite a big company, there's now 60 of us, and we do the full creative offer from 
digital, to strategy, to branding, to design, to film, to immersive stuff. Um, but I head up a very small part of that company, so it's the creative technology department, and there's just two of us. And we're both very much makers at heart. We've both come from a very similar place. We've both got the same sort of mentality towards creating stuff through this playful and very experimental way. And at Uniform, it's my job to take new emerging technologies and find interesting new applications for them. Um, where am I now? Uh, yeah, and so the, the way these things make money in Uniformer's world, um, the projects that I lead, probably 90% of them are all internal R&D projects. So <coughs> they're not aimed to ever go to market. That's never the initial intention. That's just to, um, the main intention of them is to explore these technologies, excite potential clients, and just start interesting conversations with people. So the profitability from these R&D projects comes from this long tail of people being interested and coming to Uniform to use all our, some of the creative tech offers, but also the other offers that we have as well. And also, R&D tax credits are a wonderful thing and pay for a lot of the stuff we do at Uniform. Um, but recently we started to think about taking stuff to market and it's not really worked out as of yet. Um, we've come up with these great ideas and we think, okay, let's kickstart or this or think about how we can juice this at a low enough cost that uh, we can make money and people will actually want to buy it. Um, but every time we started to go into those conversations, we just think that you need to, because we're doing quite high tech stuff, you need to de-scope your idea quite a lot and it becomes this conflict of do you want to compromise what your original idea was or do you want to go for something that's much simpler um, and we always end up kind of scrapping it so we're compromising on the materials we want to use because we're perfectionists or the kind of level of technology we want to use again because we're perfectionists so it's a very difficult thing that um, but recently we've just started a new project with a client who I can't say but I think this might be the one for Uniform, which is quite exciting that we might finally get a product to market. But it feels like it's cheating a little bit because we've got a massive client behind us that's paying for it and it feels like there's a bit of a safety net there. Um, there very much doesn't feel like it's a maker's style project. It feels much more like this is mass production now and it feels like a very different thing. Um, yeah, so I just want to finish with the stuff I do, I feel like there's this strange conflict at Uniform between yeah, we're creating all this stuff in a very maker style um, way of thinking where we don't need to adhere to health and safety or design rights or patents or any of that sort of stuff um, but we still, there's this pressure to take stuff to market it's very difficult to go through all those hoops and come out the other end with something that you think can make money more so. Thank you.